We've been fighting a long time. We have all lost so very much. So many loved ones gone. But you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. You have no idea how important you are. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Ave Maricela. We're going to start with a daily prayer that will be helpful for probably most people. It says, Lord, I thank you that this day uh, I have not gossiped, quarreled, uh, been selfish or intemperate with alcohol. Uh, But in a few minutes, I'm going to get out of bed and I'm really going to need your help. (laughs) If you can relate, it's good that you're here today. So this this talk, a traditional Lent, what the church has done over the years. So I guess if that makes it traditional, then this is a traditional Lent. I would say the one aspect um, that I would would, um, oppose it to, perhaps, is the modern Lent, which tends to be weak. Uh, The emphasis is on God loves you, which is true, but God loves you no matter what, and even the blasphemers and the sinners and the apostates, even they have a place in the communion of saints. Right? That's the idea these days, uh, which is not a very good idea to have entering Lent. Right? Uh, what we want to do is realize uh, we want to take considerations from Scripture. Unless you do penance, you shall likewise perish. This kind cannot come out but by prayer and fasting. Fast and abstain on the days appointed. Uh, That's a precept of the church. So all the considerations from the beginning were, uh, we need to do penance. We must do penance. We are weak creatures. Our human nature inclines us to excuses, to laziness, uh, to indulgence, and so on. And it takes work. It takes effort to fight back against that uh, 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 precipitous um, uh, tendency towards, uh, towards laziness, weakness, selfishness, and so on. So Lent, historically, right, traditionally, Lent was a time to refocus. Uh, Lent is not something to get over with as soon as you can, right? Lent should be something that builds every single year. We should almost have like a 40-year plan for Lent. Like Lent is 40 days, have a 40-year plan. Uh, Every single Lent that comes around, we should be a little bit better, a little bit better. but, and I want you to kind of keep, keep in mind, um, well, let's see, long term. Keep in mind a stock market graph that's going up, right? Over 40 years, it goes up. But this year, it might be down. The next year, it goes up. The next year, it goes down, and it goes up. That's what Lent is going to be like. This Lent, year after year, you're going to have some Lents that are better, better than others. Keep in mind the long game. Keep in mind, I, I want to be... Um, well, there was a thing in the military when I was, when I was in, it was um, fit for life, which had a, dub- a double meaning, fit for life. Think about your whole life. You want to be fit for your whole life, and you want to be fit for the life that you're living. You don't need to be a bodybuilder. You don't need to be whatever it is. Be good at what it is you need to be good at. Uh, and so that should tailor our let. Uh, we don't have to be, if, if we're not you know, monks and nuns or desert hermits or whatever, you can't be staying up all night in prayer, right? Your, your goal shouldn't be, oh, you know, I'm going to spend two hours in prayer every day, but then your kids or your family gets neglected, right? Don't do that. Think about your life, who you deal with, and tailor your penances to your state in life. What do I need to be good at? What are the virtues that I need to have? That, that's, that's a good way to think about it. Um, other things to think about with Lent is justice requires us to make recompense to God for our sins. We have sinned, we have offended God, and, and this is a time to say, okay, you know, maybe um, uh, it's gonna be uncomfortable, I'm gonna get, sacrifice some things, I should sacrifice. All throughout the whole rest of the year, how many times have I gone to communion, or co- confession? I hope a lot. God has forgiven me so many times, but now's the time for me to really focus and do some penance for my sins. And I'll tell you, the, the church fathers say, if all you ever do, if the only penance you ever do 
is the penance the priest gives you at confession, that is not enough. I mean, if you make it to heaven, you're going to go to purgatory for a long time. Do more penance. We must be doing penance. And the stakes are high for failure, right? The rewards are out of this world, right? Uh, but the, the, the consequences for failure um, are eternal. And so the, it's better to err on the side of caution. Um, and you know, the, the ancient or the old saints, they didn't worry about their health so much. Uh, to a degree, like, well, I can't do this because of that, or I can't do this. Don't make excuses. Right? Don't be imprudent, but don't make excuses about things. We, we, our mind can tend to go in that direction. Um, and there's a certain, even a natural motive, you could say, for Lent. Um, excellence requires effort. If you want to be excellent at something, you need to put forth the effort to do it. If you've ever, you know, that's what is it, um, anybody who's older than 40, or should be, knows that if you give somebody something and you make it too easy, they don't appreciate it, right? Anybody, any rich person who's given their spoiled son a, Fer a Ferrari or whatever, they know. The kid wrecks it, doesn't respect it. Uh, so that's why there's a certain effort that must go into achieving sanctity. God gives sanctity. We don't achieve sanctity. We don't uh, acquire sainthood because I worked so hard. God rewards humility with sanctity. He sees us working day after day after day, doing normal, everyday things because we love him, we love our neighbor, we want to do what is good, and God rewards that fidelity with an increasing sanctity. Maybe we see it, maybe we don't. Maybe we perceive it, maybe others perceive it, maybe they don't. That is beside the point. Sanctity is a gift from God, and he only gives it when he knows it's going to be safe. That's so how we only advance. We only have as much sanctity as we have humility. So all these things are pre-considerations to when we enter Lent. This is, these are the fundamental dispositions we have to have. Uh, another foundation is, is humility and honesty. I say this all the time. Humility and honesty are like interchangeable. A humble person is an honest person because they admit the truth. This is where I am. This is who I am and it's not good, right? It's not pretty. But this is where I am. So that being the case, what can I do? Right? How much can I do? Um, I'm not good at fasting. I'm not good at prayer. I'm not good at this. I'm not good at that. OK, accept it. And then move forward. What would I tell a person who isn't good at these things? How would I tell them to advance? Take your own advice. Um, have you ever noticed people? They're, they're one way around you, and then they're a different way around other people. They like put on this pretend, maybe like you had a high school friend or something. Like they, 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 they get nervous, but they put on this fake personality. And it's a kind of a projection because if people don't like the fake person that I put on, well, that's not me, right? That person can be embarrassed or humiliated or whatever, and I don't have to worry about it. Um, don't put on a fake person for God. Don't pretend to be somebody you're not when you're in prayer. When you're considering your sanctity or lack of it, just be honest. And if you have a hard time doing penance, if you have a hard time with Lent, be honest with God. Be like, God, I am not very good at Lent. I don't want to do Lent, and that is not good. But this is the real me, and you want to have a relationship with me and not this fake pious person I want to pretend to be. So let's be honest, and what can I do? Right? Start there with God. Be honest. Uh, so let's get into uh, a little bit. Um, Lent, we could say there's, um, the attitude we have during Lent is sacrifice. And there are two fundamental kinds of sacrifice, which is active and passive. An active sacrifice is something I take upon myself. I'm going to do this as a sacrifice. A passive sacrifice is when something happens to me the outside of my control that I can use as a sacrifice. And anybody who's married knows the best involuntary sacrifice is your spouse and your kids. Like, those are the best penances. The saints are absolutely unanimous in telling us the absolute best penances are the ones we do not choose. Because we tend, we te even when we choose sacrifices, even when we're doing penance for Lent, we have a tendency to choose what I'm, I'm good at, or at least what I'm better at, or at least what I don't hate the most. 
And that's what, that's what family and friends are for, is to impose upon us those burdens like, I would rather deal with anything than you right now. <laughs> that is the best Lent. That is the best penance, right? Is not allowing yourself to get angry, bitter, selfish, um, uh, you know, self-pitying, whatever it is. That is the absolute best penance that, that you can do for Lent because that is working on where you will not work on it yourself. Right? Because you don't, either you don't know how, you're blind, or whatever it may be. Uh, but I would say, for, for Lent, every single Lent, make the resolution, I will not, I'm, I'm going to really try not to get irritated, not to get upset, not to fall into self-pity. I'm not going to let exterior circumstances shake my peace. Right? If you can take that as your penance, that would be a very, very fruitful Lent. And that's something that, um, again, Lent shouldn't end right, with Easter, we should say, okay, of what I've done during Lent, of the changes I've made to myself during Lent, what can I continue throughout the rest of the year, right? How can I continue this attitude of self-control, of um, uh, self-sacrifice, of, of patiently bearing with wrongs and so on and whatever they may be. So that, that's, that's a very good attitude to have. Uh, so active and passive efforts. And then of our active efforts, things that I choose to do during Lent, uh, we could say there's uh, kind of positive and negative, right? Positive is I'm going to do something good for Lent. I'm going to say more prayers. I'm going to read more of the Bible. I'm going to go out of my way to be kinder to other people, right? Something that is, is more in a positive direction. And then there is the negative, like I'm going to um, fast, right? I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to eat. Or I'm going to do extra, uh, I'm going to pray the rosary with my arms outstretched or something, right? Something uh, painful, something difficult, something uncomfortable. Uh, so we can think of it that way. So there, there, there's uh, passively, I accept what happens to me during Lent in a spirit of um, uh, reparation. Actively, I'm going to do some good things. And actively, I'm going to do some uncomfortable things, right? That, that should be kind of our three-pronged uh, approach for Lent. Um, Am I holding this close enough? Or should it be closer? No, okay. They say no, they say yes. And some don't care. That's the spirit. Uh, okay, so, moving along. I think I read somewhere this was supposed to be like question and answer, but we'll get to that. Um, okay, so the first thing, like let's take, let's take for, um, right away something positive, prayer. So prayer is, I've talked about this, and Kevin talked about this too, right, before me. He talked a lot about prayer. I won't go into that. I will simply say that um, uh, prayer would fall into that category of things I'm going to do for Lent that may require, well, that will require a sacrifice. It's going to require a sacrifice perhaps of time, a sacrifice of being more organized, or a sacrifice of concentration. Like, I'm not very good at prayer. I resolve to concentrate more at prayer. I'm going to focus my mind. And that can even be a penance. Where for some people, concentrating, like they say, I'll say, are you doing your daily prayers? Yes, Father. How about your meditation? Uh, well, I say the rosary. I do the Bible. Do you do meditation? Father, I'm not very good at meditation. Excuses, excuses. You don't like it, do you? No, because you're, you're a distracted person. You're probably a sanguine temperament or something. Make yourself focus. Sit down, set the timer. I'm going to sit here and fidget for 15 minutes. <laughs> right? If that's all you can do, if that's how your meditation starts out, that is better than nothing. But don't avoid meditation because it's so difficult or because I'm not good at it. Right? There's a, this attitude of this, I don't know, American some attitude where if I'm not good at something, it's not very valuable. Don't get into that, that habit. Um, prayer is valuable. Prayer is spending time with God. And if you sit down and, and you sit there and it's like, well, Father, I'm not getting anything out of prayer. Well, prayer is not for, really for you anyways. <laughs> prayer is for God. Is he getting something out of prayer? Yes, he's getting injustice. You owe him time. Uh, injustice, you owe him worship. Injustice, you owe him adoration. Why are you thinking about yourself during prayer? Think more about God. That's what it's for anyways. So if you sit there and you just are, are, are fidgeting and, and can't take the, the, the nothingness, that is good. You're building discipline in yourself, and it is valuable. God is getting worshipped. So that is good. 
Uh, so that is an aspect of prayer I may have, maybe haven't considered. Spend time with God in prayer. Spend more attention in prayer. Um, uh, more attention in prayer and, and, and perhaps uh, better attention and better preparation for Mass. Take more time preparing for Mass. Uh, think uh, the night before, I'm going to receive Holy Communion. I want to be recollected. Actually take the time, read your Missal, look in the Missal. Uh, if you don't have a set of prayers at the consecration, uh, develop them. Think about what should I be praying about at the consecration. That book, I, I tell you all the time, Incredible Catholic Mass, that has an incredible chapter on devotions to say at Mass, how to prepare yourself for Holy Communion, how to do a Thanksgiving after Mass. Now, the book is worth, is worth it just, just for those three chapters alone. Get that book. We have it in our bookstore. Pay more attention at Mass. That'd be a great Lenten resolution. Um, use sacramentals. Extra grace is available when we use blessed items. When you pray the rosary with a rosary, that gives you an extra grace. When you pray the rosary with a blessed rosary, that gives you double extra grace. Right? So make use of sacramentals. Uh, the rosary, uh, St. Benedict medal, miraculous medal, scapular, holy water, blessed salt, blessed oil, candles. These are all sacramentals. They have a purpose. Um, I've said it before, uh, re resolve to get a traditional calendar. Know the feast days, know the saints, know the liturgical season, right? Pay attention to the church's calendar. Attend more often, holy hour, Thursday night, 7 p.m. Uh, Stations of the Cross, those are going to be Friday nights, beginning uh, after Ash Wednesday. Stations of the Cross, uh, 6 p.m. Go to confession more often, once a month is good, or attend daily mass one extra time per week. Right? Those are all sacrifices of time that you can give to God. Uh, this Lent, I'm going to spend more time paying attention to other people. And the first person I'm going to pay more attention to is God. Right? That would be a good sacrifice. In fact, we could say Lent is about thinking of other people. Uh, and I would say the biggest problem in the, in the world today is a lack of maturity. The whole world is immature. The whole world is behaving like insane children. Um, and, and so when we resolve, I'm going to grow up, I'm going to stop thinking about myself and about what's comfortable and about what is important to me, and I'm going to start thinking about what is important to God, what is important to other people, and how can I serve, right? Not be served, how can I serve others? So there's a hallmark that can help us um, you know, break out of a, of a selfish or childish way of thinking. Um, considering others, so that's a positive thing we can do for Lent. Uh, another uh, positive thing we can do for Lent, positive steps, is to consider ourselves uh, in greater detail. What are my habits that are not good? What are, what are my thought patterns? What are my patterns of speech? What is my pattern of relating to other people? Because very often we get stuck in, in kind of a way of reacting. I expect this, I react this way, and, I mean, 90% of our lives every day are the same. We interact with the same people, we do the same things, uh, we encounter the same things, and we think, why is my life hard? Why are things difficult? Well, every difficult circumstance in your life has one thing in common. You. <laughs> right? If you changed you, every circumstance in your life would also change. Because the source has changed. So that is the first place to look. I, you know, do I have a way of responding to somebody that I need to change? Do I have a way of speaking? Do I have a way of acting? Do I have a way of thinking? I was just talking the other day with someone and they, they identified, like in, in psychology, identifies um, pathological ways of thinking. Uh, there's first of all, of course, like the, the, the victim mentality, as somebody, I'm always a victim. Uh, and then there is a catastrophism. Catastrophism is turning everything into a, just, just the worst thing ever. I'm just waiting, there's gonna be a catastrophe. Something happens and it like fits enough of the criteria, there you go, you see, catastrophe. Right? Stop doing that. Stop thinking that way. Change how you think. Um, this is, even the ancient pagans realized this. The Stoic philosophers, uh, pagans recognized nothing on the outside can affect you on the inside unless you allow it to happen. You allow this or that misfortune to say, this is bad. This happened, and I don't want that, and it's bad, and woe is me. Stop thinking like that. Here's what you're going to do. This is a penance everybody's going to do. You're going to trade with God. You're going to trade. 
So, and, and remember, the, the, the best penance is that thing that happens to you beyond your control, and you don't want to suffer it, and you're sitting there stewing, you're like, okay, this is my penance, I don't want to suffer this, I'm grinding my teeth, it's still not working, right? It's, uh, I'm, 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 I'm getting impatient. Ask yourself, okay, what if God came down and asked me to make a trade? Okay, what I'll do is, if you suffer this, whatever it is, if you suffer this well and don't lose your temper, I will take all that grace and apply it somewhere where you want. So where do you want this grace? Do you want to convert your friend, your mother, your father? you want your, your child to come back to the faith? Do you want your husband to realize whatever? Do you want your wife to stop being so crazy? Whatever it is. <laughs> and ask yourself, okay, if I, knew I, if I knew I was achieving that goal, would I be willing to voluntarily endure this? And keep going until you would, like yes. What would it take for me to endure this with a happy heart? Well, if I knew that so-and-so would convert, of course I'd suffer this. This is well worth it. Make that trade. Because that is what happens. When we endure wrongdoings, when we endure things with a patient heart, and we offer it to God, that is boatloads of grace for us and for others. And, and, and I tell this to spouses all the time. Uh, that, is how, that is how spouses are supposed to heal their spouse, is by taking the wounds their spouse cause, causes them and offering it for them. That is very Christ-like, uh, because Christ was bruised for our offenses. He was crushed on account of our sins. The Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all, we the bride of Christ, and by his stripes we are healed. Right, that's Isaiah and um, uh, I think uh, Ezekiel, Jeremiah. So we can take that attitude with anything and everything. If something's causing me pain, I turn it into grace, and I, it gets applied wherever, wherever I see fit. That's a great trade. And then the worst things in your life, the most difficult things, the hardest penances, become your uh, grace factory. Like this is, the, this is a gold mine for me. And you're accomplishing something. You are making progress in the spiritual life. You are affecting people. You're affecting the world. And it's because of this suffering that you're enduring well and properly. So that, that is a great, um, what do they call that, a mind hack? It's more of a realization. This is already possible. This is what we can do. This is what God wants. Realize it. It's effective and it works. Okay, that was, so that was, um, let's see. Uh, passive suffering, uh, turn it into grace, be considerate of others. Okay. So, uh, in enduring, enduring what others cause us, let's think about ourselves. Okay. What can I do for others? Maybe I've got, again, those negative thought patterns, those negative speech patterns. Um, give others the benefit of the doubt. Start thinking, maybe they didn't do this on purpose to hurt me. Right? Maybe they didn't intentionally do this or that. Uh, maybe, just maybe, uh, other people are as selfish as I am, and they don't even think about me. They're not thinking about me, they're thinking about themselves, right? A lot of times we think that others are out to get us. I'll stop and realize, you know, most people, they don't think that far ahead, right? <laughs> so again, re realign how you think, right? Especially how you think about others. Um, actions, seek to serve others before self. These are good penances. Uh, change your speech patterns. Um, I would say that, that God gave us the faculty of speech not to cut others down, not to profane, uh, but to speak kindly, to build others up, to speak the truth, to speak charitably, to repeat good stories of others, to build others by our example. That's why we have a tongue, right? Not for gossip or cussing or swearing or foul language or whatever. It's unbecoming of the saints, which is who we are, who we're supposed to be. Uh, so think about how you're speaking to others. Um, hmm. And in this regards, um, some people are very just witty by nature, and that wit can come out as sarcasm. Sarcasm is okay as long as both people find it funny. <laughs> right? Not just you, both. <laughs> Ask yourself that question. If, if the answer is yes, okay, you can, you can, you can be sarcastic. But... Not otherwise. And it has to really be, like, they have to agree it's funny. You think it's funny. No, I don't. Yes, you do. <laughs> that doesn't work. 
uh, with speech, stop complaining. Stop grumbling. Uh, suffering is like, a, like just these buckets of grace, and complaining is poking holes in the bucket, and all your grace is leaking out. The, 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 the sad thing about complaining is that you are already enduring the difficult thing. You are already enduring what is painful, and all you do by complaining is remove the benefit from it. You're not removing the, the suffering, all you're doing is removing the benefit from the suffering by grumbling, complaining, blaming others, <clears throat> blaming your priests, whatever. <laughs> um, two, with, with venial sins, uh, I just have this note here. Venial sins are not freebies. Well, I mean, come on, it wasn't a mortal sin. Sin is like leeches on the soul. So that's another good way, especially to look at um, sins of the tongue. Because honestly, it's hard. Uh, what is it? James chapter 3. If any man offend not in word, the same is perfect. Uh, sins of the tongue are the hardest to overcome. Um, so realize it takes time. Uh, and even if you're, you say, well, I'm sinning in tongue, but so what? Overcome it. It's hard, but don't make peace with your sins. Fight valiantly against it. Um, okay, considering others in speech. It, they kind of go together. When you consider others and consider yourself as well, you know, I need to be more punctual. I need to be on time. I need to show more respect to other people. I need to be more organized. I need to be more, uh, whatever, efficient with the tasks I'm supposed to do because other people rely on me. Um, I need to change how I think because changing how I think will enable me to change how I speak and that affects others. Um, so they're considering others and self very, very much related, but also, um, hmm. Hmm. too many ideas, sorry. When, when we're reading, especially when we're reading um, older manuals on Lent and, and, and sacrifice and so on, you'll hear these terms, uh, self-contempt or self-hatred. And that can, be, that can be difficult, like, what does that mean? That, 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 am I supposed to have a low self-esteem? What are they talking about? Uh, you cannot hate what is good. And God didn't create, and God created everybody, and everybody is good, so in that regard, you cannot hate yourself. What they're talking about, spiritual authors, is Anything good we have comes from God, like grace and virtue and our personality and all those things, that all comes from God. Anything that comes from me is going to be sin. Uh, I misuse my talents. I didn't acquire virtue. I sinned here, I sinned there, I'm selfish, I'm this, I'm that. That's the self-hatred they're talking about. Whatever about me is bad, that's what I hate because that's not the real me. Remember that, that, that fake person? There could be two fake people. The pretend pious person over here, and then the low self-esteem, I'm a wretched uh, loser over here. That is not true, right? We're in the middle. Uh, we are, God created us to be saints, to be perfect in virtue, have perfect control, and we may, you know, some are more virtuous than others, but by loving yourselves, you are gonna hate the false versions on either side. I'm not that pious. I'm not a saint yet, I hope to be. Uh, uh, don't, don't praise me for these virtues I don't have. But I'm not gonna beat myself up for these pretend vices that, that are really distorted anyways. Right, so there's a difference. You have to split that difference in the middle. Um, and if we are honest, right, if we love virtue and that's what we're striving for during Lent, uh, loving virtue, wherever I find virtue, I'm going to love it and want to imitate it. In, in, in my friends, family, in, in spouses, in, in whatever it may be, that's a virtue, I want it. Uh, you know, I draw it unto myself. We do that over time, we start to perceive in ourselves virtue, which is lovable and praiseworthy and will fill us with confidence. Right? And that, that's the kind of self-love we should have. Why do I love myself? Because of what God put in me. You know, all these virtues, the, the patience, the charity, the, um, the discipline, the studiousness, the prayerfulness, the piety. Be honest about your virtues. And it requires us to be able to perceive virtue, what they are, but that's the proper uh, balance we're trying to uh, seek during Lent. We should not have this self-hatred, um, this, this distorted version of what self-hatred means. It means being honest. Here are my strengths, here are my weaknesses, I've got work to do. That's what we're the attitude we need to have. Mm. 
Okay, um, fasting. The easiest penance to do during Lent is the traditional uh, practice, which was fast and uh, fast every single day during Lent, which means two smaller meals and one full meal. Uh, if you do that, that's very easy. You don't have to sit there and think, what am I gonna do for Lent? What am I gonna do for Lent? I'm gonna do what everybody did for Lent, all the way up to like 1962, I think it was, or whatever. Um, that's easy. I mean, it's not easy, but it's easy. It's simple, there we go. It's not easy, but it's very simple and it's very clear. Um, so that's one that I recommend. But again, uh, what is your state in life? If fasting like that uh, makes you more tired, makes you more irritable, makes you whatever, accept that as true and realize better than me taking on this activity which is pious and good and causing me to sin against everybody else, I'm gonna step back, right? I'm not, maybe I'm not gonna fast like I wanted to, I'm gonna accept the penance which comes. Uh, but if there's one good thing the Jesuits did, that is the Jesuit fast. Uh, which they recognize this, that they, at one point they, you know, they were Catholic. Um, <laughs> Uh, they, they had a lot of work to do, and they realized, you know, um, they had uh, Jesuits who were very studious, required a lot of attention, a lot of energy, and depriving oneself of food, basic food, um, sapped them of that. They were not able to do what they needed to do very well. So there's this thing called the, the Jesuit fast, which is giving up not quantity, but quality. I'm going to eat the same amount of food, but no salt. Right, no, no salad dressing, no butter, no whatever it may be, Cre cream in the coffee, like no more. Uh, very basic. Or yes, I'll have coffee, but not hot coffee. I'm gonna leave it like room temperature, let it get old and stale. You still get the caffeine, but it just doesn't taste very good. That's, that's the Jesuit fast, and so you can do that, right? I mean, try eating oatmeal with nothing but oatmeal and water. Right? You get the nutrition, but oof, it's not easy. Right, some people like it, I don't know. Uh, but that is one way, so the Jesuit fast. You don't have to give up quantity, give up quality. Um, you can also do uh, intermittent fasting, right? Fast during certain times of the day, or I'm only gonna eat between the hours of 10 a.m. and you know, 2 p.m. or something, like one meal a day or something like that. Uh, so different ways you can look at fasting. Um, and then of course you have the extension, uh, fast from the media, or news, or the iPhone, or electronics, or whatever it may be. Right, I'm, I'm going to with, withdraw myself from you know, this habit I've formed. That can be a kind of an alternate form or an additional, I should say, form of fasting. Um, and I would say that uh, Lent is primarily, it is supposed to be a time where we do uh, make a sacrifice. We do some kind of penance, we do some kind of fasting. It's not supposed to be, well, for, for Lent, I'm not gonna do any fasting, I'm not gonna do any penance, beyond what's strictly required, but I'm gonna be more prayer. I'm gonna be more kind, I'll be more this. I would say you wanna do something. You wanna do something that is uncomfortable. You wanna do something that is penitential. Um, and, and I think a good, um, a, a good progression is, is give yourself some room. Right, what you don't want to do is rush into Lent, kind of like, this is going to be the best Lent ever, I don't know how, but I'm just going to tell myself that because I hope I can keep up my penances. And then a week in, you crash and burn, and then that's the rest of Lent. Don't do that. Right, so have a very low bar. Like, I'm going to do this very simple, very easy penance that I'm almost certain I can do the whole 40 days. It'll be easy for me to do this. I know I can do it. I know I should do it, I'm gonna to commit to that easy penance. Then I'm gonna have this other level of penance that like, okay, I'm gonna do this more challenging penance, and I'm not sure if I can do it, but I'm, I'm gonna try. And if I fall off the bandwagon, I'm gonna get back on, right? Don't think that if you, if you break your Lenten penance that, oh dear, um, that's it, might as well just give up. Don't do that, it's about as much as possible. And then I'll have this kind of harder penance that you're willing to you're willing to compromise on. It is so important because there's gonna be those days where this happens, that happens, oh no, this is frustrating, and that was frustrating, and I can't believe what you just said to me, and then look at this, and then the end of the day comes and you've had it, right? 
yield. Like maybe like people give up sweets or whatever it is. Some, for some people, sweets are your comfort food. Sweets is your stress relief. And the worst thing, the worst thing is, sorry, homeschool moms, the busy homeschool mom, she has nine kids and they stress her out and her stress relief is whatever that comfort food is. And then during Lent, she gives up her comfort food and the kids stress her out. She goes to her comfort food and that stresses her out because I'm supposed to give this up. Now she's double stressed with no stress relief. Don't do that. Like stop that. So if you're gonna give up a comfort food, uh, make it that difficult thing that you're going to not feel guilty about when, you, when you're at the end of your wits, right? When your nerves are just frazzled. Don't push yourself into that, right? Well, Lent should be a positive thing that is difficult, but it should stay positive, right? Even the negative, even the fasting and the penances, those need to stay positive. Uh, you don't want to finish Lent and be like, that was the worst time ever, I'm sick of it. That's, you don't want Lent to end like that, right? It should end positively like, you know, uh, I had some victories, I had some setbacks, but overall, um, I made progress. Right, even if it's small. Because this Lent may not have been very good, but you know, the next 39, I'm gonna do better. Right? Now, now we never know, right? We could leave and, and every Lent, we should strive every Lent because this could be our last. This might be the last opportunity I have to do penance. Um, but this is so important in the spiritual life. So important is um, I, I, um, love and guilt. Right? Love and guilt. Guilt cannot be what makes you a saint. Guilt can get you to do the minimum. Guilt starts you on the path to sanctity, right? Fear of the Lord includes fear of uh, feeling guilty or shame. Shame and guilt, those are negative emotions, but they are good, right? It's like pain to the soul. What, what, what pain is to the body, shame and guilt are to the soul. And that is gonna inspire you to do something. Well, I'll feel guilty and ashamed if I don't do anything for Lent, so I'll do this. Okay, that's a good start. But to finish, right, to become a saint, you have to love God. You have to love what he loves. You have to conform your mind to his mind, your emotions to his, right, your thoughts to his, and so on. And so that is what is gonna make us a saint. Why do I do this? Not because I have to, not because I feel guilty if I don't, but because I love God. I just don't even think about not doing it because it's just what I do. Right, like, like moms. So often, right, we take our moms so much for granted. I mean, even moms take themselves for granted. Like, why do they love their kids so much? You know, I've seen the brattiest kids, you little monsters, <laughs> how you treat your mom, what you say to your mom, the fits you throw, and then when your birthday comes around, you expect a cake, you expect presents, you expect a card from your mom to say how much she loves you. Like, I think moms have like the secret backdoor entrance to heaven uh, because they, they sacrifice so much naturally. They just do it. I mean, if you have to tell a mom, I mean, who tells their mom, you know, you should, well, I don't say that, but there, there's so much that moms do, they don't have to be told to do it. They just do it because that's what I do. I want to do it. I love my kids and I want to do this for them. And, and that is something we can all, I think, learn from. Think about your own mothers and what they did for you and really how self-sacrificial that was. Uh, that's, that should be our attitude towards uh, prayer. That sanctity is not doing things because we have to, we just don't even think about it, I want to do it. Uh, that's kind of our end goal. Um, so let's see, so um, passive penances are the best. Active penances, we should be careful about how we choose those, but try to challenge ourselves. And then those, those penances of the mind, like I said, force yourself to concentrate on prayer, concentrate on the task at hand, change your thought patterns, change your speech patterns. Um, and in, in doing so, we should really seek to have an integral life. Uh, integral comes from that word, um, where we get integrity from it. But integral is something that is necessary to the functioning of the whole. If you take something out, the whole thing's not gonna work. And an integral life is one in which every aspect of our lives we have given to God and we are seeking to, to purify. And, and we could say that's another idea of Lent, is a purification. Is um, what about, my, again, my thoughts, my speech, my words, my action, my dress, 
how I live, um, uh, you know, how I work, how I play, uh, how, I, how I recreate, what are my habits, all those things. We should be examining our entire lives and thinking what needs to change. That's what we're going to find that um, when, when everything, this is called peace. Peace is a tranquility of order. And when everything is ordered, everything is where it should be, everything's working towards the same goal, that's when we, are, we, we are, uh, achieve that, that serenity of spirit. Because we're not warring amongst ourselves. I'm not saying this over here and totally focused on this and completely ignoring this. Right? There, there's, there's a stepping back and a looking at everything and a balancing. Um, There is um, more here, but I will stop there and take a few minutes of questions. Um, there we go. What? What? Because oh, yes, Roger. Thank you. I Changed my speech patterns. Yeah, this, see, this is something that he's got to work on. So let's do. Not and so soon. Wait till after my talk. Anyway, uh, a compliment to you. A year ago, no, no compliments. Yeah, a year ago. You did a you did a sermon before Lance about talking. Thank you, Roger. You're welcome. <laughs> I'll refrain from any other comments. <laughs> Questions? Hold on. No, you no, yeah, you try to hide it as a scratch. Oh, mm. All right, I know somebody's got something. <laughs> oh, sorry, Stephen. What's the criteria we use on selecting penance? Um, I recorded this talk. <laughs> just re rewatch. Like everything I just said, um, uh, Holy Ghost. Right? Like I said, uh, the, the criteria. Try to do, we'll summarize. Something positive, like more prayer, more kindness, more good works. Something negative, like affliction, penance, um, oh, uh, good penance I missed. When you wake up at night and can't go back to sleep, get up and pray a rosary. Get up and read the Bible. That is a great way to do vigils, right? What uh, Teresa of Avila called that turning necessity into virtue. Um, scientifically, too, if you read something or do something, rather than sitting there tossing and turning, you actually go to sleep faster. So something positive, something negative, and then most importantly, resolve to accept whatever happens to you and have in mind who do I want to convert? Or what in my life do I want to change? Who do I want to affect with grace? And write out these goals. These are my um, beneficiaries. When something bad happens, I'm going to remember these petitions, offer the grace for them, and I guarantee you, you will help, that will help you to um, uh, endure it peacefully. So some of those criteria. Health, nutrition, diet. What else? Oh, ember days, thank you. So um, ember days are like mini lens throughout the year. The ember days are days of fasting and penance commemorating the change of the seasons. So it's in, there's Pentecost around June, uh, there's September um, around the, the exaltation of the cross, there's the Advent ember days and then the Lent ember days. And those are to remind us, the other three, penance and sacrifice is not something we do only during Lent. Remember what you did during Lent? Let's remember that in June. Let's remember that in September. Let's remember that in Advent. All right? Penance is not a sometime thing. It's a, it's a uh, kind of a continuing thing. So uh, the Ember Days used to be mandatory fasting and penance. Uh, they were the, the Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. But they're not um, even on the church calendar anymore. Uh, they're on the traditional calendar. Uh, but those would be good days to mark on the calendar and say, OK, when these days come around, I'm going to try to do some of my Lenten penances again. Right, remember it throughout the year. So that, that's a good way to, to make use of that. Yep. For the, uh, for the doing it for like... Yeah, sure, that's a good idea. So the question is, if, if, if we're trying to hold each other accountable, like I think Kevin talked about that a little, um, can we do that? Like, can I call the other person and we're not in the same room, we're at, I'm just there on the phone, but is that a good way of holding each other accountable and doing our meditation and prayer? Yes. Plus, if you start to hear snoring from the phone, <laughs> you hang up and call them back. Wake up. What else?
Right. So to teach children how to meditate daily, um, actually, um, Father Dennis Gordon, my last pastor from um, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, he had this thing called the St. Tarsicius group. And I don't know how he could sit down with three year olds and keep them quiet for half an hour. Like he taught them to meditate. I have kept meaning to call him back and say, Father, how did you do that? Um, but I would think that you, you can't give what you don't have, and he, he was a very spiritual, very meditative. So if you, if you can sit down with kids, and if you can explain to them, walk them through a meditation. Do it yourself first, and then talk your children through it. That, that can be very helpful. Uh, but meditation is just, it's spending time with God. And he's not gonna, you're not going to audibly hear God talk back to you, but you can sit down, you can talk to God like you would a friend, or you read the Bible, or you look at pictures, or just look at a picture of a saint. Um, that can be good ways to meditate. Um, but yeah, that, that's... Oh. There are calendars. Oh. Okay, thank you. The other question is, Father, should we get to know the church calendar? Yes, and we have some over there. If you don't have one, there they are. What? I mean... Yes, Lord. Okay, great point, great point. Um, there was a point about how um, Dan Bergman, for one Lent, didn't do anything except fasting and abstaining on the days appointed. But after that, every Lent has been better. Every Lent has been good. And I'm recalling a story in the seminary. This seminarian was stuck in this rut of penance. He was trying to achieve sanctity out of guilt. And his spiritual director told him, I forbid you from doing any penance. And the seminarian was like horrified, but that snapped him out of it. Like he had this pathological idea about like, I have to do this, if I think about it, I have to do it. And so that snapped him out of it. The next year came around, he was able to recover and actually start doing things properly. So that can be something you have to admit. Remember what I said about humility? If you have to admit, you know what? This Lent, my penance is gonna be hanging on, right, by my pinky fingers. Because it's all I can do. Life is so hard. I'm just so done with everything. The most I can do is just, you know, go to Mass and, and do basic prayers. That may be it. Maybe that's where you are. Admit that. Uh, accept it. And then just say, okay, you know, I'm going to either do a small penance throughout the whole rest of the year. I'm going to do better next Lent. Be okay with where you are. Right? You don't, don't go from zero to 60. You know, pull a spiritual hamstring or something. <laughs> Okay, one more question and then, and then we'll conclude. Better be a good one. <laughs> yes, Mark. <laughs> it used to be that people gave up meat for all of Lent. Right. Oh, oh, that's too good of a question. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, so the, the question is what did the rules used to be and what are they now and why did they change them? So, for my next talk. <laughs> Now, that, that is a really good question, and honestly, okay, I'm going to do something, don't be scandalized. Go to the SSPX website. <laughs> they have a great explanation of Lent, that very question on what did we used to do, what are the current regulations, if you want to follow the old, here they are, this is not binding, this is binding, here's the explanation, I mean, that's where I got some of the stuff here. It's very good, um, they've, they've already done this. So. Um, I, I found it by typing in, um, I think, traditional Lent or something like that, and boom, up it comes. Um, don't go anywhere else, right, on the SSPX website. <laughs> but you can look at that penance, you know, website. Okay. Uh, okay, so did I miss anything? Any last announcements? Um, I think we've, we have trapped you oh, down there with the table. You have to pass by the table. If you don't take a prayer guide, feel guilty. <laughs> That's good, Gil. Um, and uh, also, if you don't know, you see that big square thing with the pins on it? If you want to know who your neighbors are, um, people have put a pin where their house is. There's a number on the pin and a color. Look up like Red 41. This is not roulette, but you know, there, all right, there we go. In that book there, there's a black, black pins and red pins. So if you want to know who your neighbors are, there you go. Good way of networking. Uh, one more announcement. Better be yeah. good. Don't forget your kids in the basement. <laughs> she says that from experience. 
That is good humility. Don't forget your kids in the basement. If you'd like to make a donation, you can with Lisa. Ooh. Okay, that was the best one. <laughs> Let's stand. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Glory be.